Well, hello, beautiful. Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger. A pleasure to be here with you today and have an awesome show for you. Super excited because I fell madly in love with this ferocious lioness of a woman. And uh, so I'm going to be bringing you someone who's very fierce, someone who's a survivor, and someone who's completely recreated herself. And where she started was pretty auspicious to begin with. So we'll bring Dr. Cherie on in a little bit. And um, thanks for joining. Thanks for putting me on the map. I have to say, I've been doing this show, it'll be 13 years in June. And this show has been nominated for two People's Choice Podcast Awards for a Webby Award. And it's available on over 40 syndicated outlets. Go to all the podcast sites where you like to go and you'll get to listen to Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger. And if you love seeing what we look like, and a lot of people really enjoy that, go to youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger, subscribe, leave a five-star review, or an Apple podcast, leave a five-star review, because people who really want and need to hear this conversation can join in. This is a weekly number one transformation conversation. And the show is rated right now. I like to keep you up to date on the latest rankings. Number 100 in self-improvement on all of Apple Podcasts in the USA. Number 32 in Portugal. Number 67 in Canada. Number 99 in Malaysia. Number 27 in Vietnam. I just love that people all over the world are listening and interacting with the show and loving the message. And I love you right back. So I am a certified coach. And uh, besides doing this and all the things I do, such as writing books and disseminating out into the world, I'm also a coach for those things. I help people to write a page turner book. I run a company that takes an author's book fully done for them to a guaranteed international best-selling status. And I teach the ultimate visibility formula, how you can be interviewed on radio and podcasts and get crazy awesome results. So this is about filling workshops, selling books, getting exposure and so much exposure that it actually repurposes itself and works on your behalf. I think media is an awesome thing. Use it. And if you'd like to join any of my programs, go to debbie-dashinger.com and you can also write to me there. I want to thank Dr. Dane here for sponsoring this show. And if you are interested in any kind of energy shift and healing or even becoming a facilitator, you can go to worldwide, Dr. Dane here, D-A-I-N-H-E-E-R.com or accessconsciousness.com. Classes, products all over the world, coming to a country near you, hopefully soon. <laughs> and right now they're doing a ton of beautiful free gifting online, so you can access them there as well. So as I promised you, Dr. Cherie is here. She's a visionary, a best-selling author, and a sought-after physician leader. Cherie is a board-certified occupational and environmental medicine physician, public health expert, and a breast cancer survivor. After breast cancer treatment, Cherie was left disabled from lymphedema in her right upper extremity, stripping her of her lifelong dream of being a practicing physician. She reinvented herself and she went on to become a national public figure, a professional speaker, and she's now a certified virtual speaker, which is awesome. Talk about being with the times. She's an entrepreneur and owner of her own healthcare consulting business. Cherie has been the catalyst for transformation in the space of cultural and workplace diversity for more than two decades. She launched her own TV show called The Live Today on CAN-TV Channel 21, as well as her podcast, Where Medicine Meets Ministry, Dr. Cherie Talks Faith and Facts. You can learn more by visiting her website at drsheriemd.com. That's D-R-S-H-E-R-I-M-D dot com. And I welcome Cherie to the Dare to Dream show. It is so great to be with you. Oh, Debbie, this is indeed a true 
honor. I mean, you and I, it's something about your spirit that just looking at you, before I even got within a few feet of you, just looking at you and that smile and what bounces out of your eyes just drew me to you. And once we came, I think, within two feet of each other, I'm like, okay, this woman is never going to be able to get rid of me in her entire life, so she might as well just get used to having me around. Oh, God, I felt the <laughs> same. Come on. In a room of 200 people, you were such a standout, right? You're such a light. And so, you know, I already love your story just based on your bio. It, I can tell it's been a profound journey. And to feel the light in you today feels really meaningful that you're able to come through mm -hmm. all that. So let's start with what you do today so people can understand that and then we'll backtrack and bounce around. Okay. Well, today I actually spend most of my time as a international professional speaker. I am a certified speaking professional, uh, which is the highest designation awarded by the NSA, the National Speakers Association. It's the highest designation that they award to anyone in the world. There are only about less than 600 of us in the wow. world. And so now I share my voice, I share my story, I share my experience in ways that allow individuals as well as organizations to move past and shift through change, to shift through tragedy, to shift through uh, changes in processes or, or, or something that was unexpected. And I was able to do this not only because of my educational uh, background from, you know, starting off at Northwestern and Loyola and med school and what have you, but also throughout my life lessons and how being flipped upside down and being turned around and being on the opposite side of the table instead of being the doctor giving the diagnosis, now being in the patient's shoes, totally shift my perspective. And it's caused me to rethink and reinvent myself and share a different legacy than the one that I had initially set out on a few decades ago. That really- So I find myself, yeah, go ahead. Well, that, what, what a way to express that. I never would have thought about that, but of course, to be on one side of the table as a doctor and then have the experience of cancer and whatever else ensued, and suddenly you are on the other side and because of it, you know, you're such a perfect example of the wound becomes the gift out to the world when you get through your mess to the other side. So, okay, how did you pivot? Let's start there, like um, cancer changes mm. everything you do. I imagine it's a long road because nobody just makes, you know, a ch well, you know, it's gonna be fine, I'm gonna head this way. I mean, it's a journey for each of us. Yes. How did you make that pivot and really show up for yourself as a resource to keeping resilient and marching forward and making new and positive changes. Wow, I really do need to hire you as my PBR person. <laughs> because that's exactly how I brought myself through, but I don't necessarily know if I would have put it in such poetic terms. Mm -hmm. But for me, what really allowed me to make that shift was uh, faith is a very uh, vital part of who I am. Okay. And my parents didn't raise, I tell people, my, pa my parents did not raise a punk. And so there have been times coming from a very, you know, born and raised on the South side of Chicago, four children, two parents working in the home, struggling, uh, keeping a roof over our heads, keeping us fed. I, I learned how to have things look good and people never really understand the struggle that it took for you to look as well as you do. Mm -hmm. And so my parents taught me this knack of getting down and doing the nitty gritty, doing the hard work, doing the work, but never really necessarily allowing the world to see how much of a struggle it was for you. Because one of the things that they impressed upon me is that my life should always be an example. Now, it doesn't mean that you don't cry. It doesn't mean that you don't have your moments. It doesn't mean that you don't share when you are anxious or when you're depressed or when you're scared. That wasn't something that they told me to shun away from. 
but there is a time for your moments. Mm -hmm. Have your moments. Grieve. Grieve the cancer. Grieve the loss of half your right breast. Grieve going through a divorce in the process. Mm -hmm. Grieve having your mother die while you're going through 15 rounds of chemotherapy. You know, grieve the 33 treatments of radiation, grieve the, the onset of lymphedema, but in your grieving and grieve properly, in your grieving, keep it moving. In your grieving, search for a new vision because your life has changed. Mm -hmm. And so therefore you need to learn something. There is a lesson to be learned, not only for you, but a lesson to be learned from the people who are watching the example that you are setting for them. Learn that lesson, share that lesson, and then grow through it and come out on the other side with something significant to share and something significant to continue your growth. Because for me, I'll never stop growing until I'm six feet under. There is never too much for me to know or learn or uh, uh, appreciate until my time here is over. So I had to step back and realize and accept, oh my God, I'm not given this diagnosis. I'm on the other end of this phone call where my breast surgeon is telling me that my pathology came back positive for cancer and that I was going to have a long journey. Mm -hmm. And although I prepared myself for that journey, I prepared my children for that journey, I prepared my parents, my mother who was in, in stages of her life, I prepared her for the journey, preparing for the journey and going through the journey. Different. Two different things. Totally. You two never know things. till you know. You can't ever exactly. know you're in it. Yeah. Correct. Holy God, when you say faith and that you have this capacity to keep looking for something deeper. Um, I don't believe the deeper comes up right away, clearly, right? You know, because no. there was a lot of pissed offness and why me, and it had to be a big soup of things. But how do you find the faith? Because that's not easy. Through no, it is those things you said, no less concurrently all those things at once. I mean, that would knock a human flat, like maybe give up the will to live. So how did you find faith or how did faith find you? Good question. I, because I had a certain measure of faith and had exemplified a certain measure of faith prior to that moment, that really helped secure me and give me that boost that I needed to get through it. And I say that to preface the next thing I'm going to say. And that is while I was going through chemo, um, my ex-husband and I, uh, it was his weekend with the kids and I'll never forget, it was right before my uh, third round of chemo. I'm home alone, I'm having crushing chest pain like an elephant is sitting on my chest. I know what this is. I'm a doctor. Mm -hmm. This is a heart attack happening. I don't know how severe, I don't know how bad, but based upon my inability to breathe and how bad this pain is, this is bad. But Debbie, in that moment, I was done. I was done. I didn't call 911. I managed to drag myself up a flight of stairs, pull out my life insurance policy, set it on my desk where I work, so that when my ex brought my kids home for the weekend, they would go up to the office, see the life insurance policy, and find me in my bed dead. All right. I promise you, I was done. My mom was dying. I had 12 more rounds of chemo. I'm bald. I'm just, I'm done. And so I just said, you know what, God, I'm going to make this real easy on you. We'll pull this out. Kids to be straight. It was a nice ass policy too. And then I climbed in bed. In some kind of way, I was able to fall asleep. I went to sleep. A few hours later, I woke up. Girl, you talking about somebody pissed? I'm like, okay, God, I made this real easy for you, and I'm still here. <laughs> so what do I have to do? What more do I have to do? Wow. But the fact that I woke up knowing just how bad things were. I was subsequently rushed at hospital because look at what happened. Normally, my ex would have stayed gone until Sunday evening when it was time to bring the kids back home. 
for the weekend. Mm -hmm. They made a stop before they went to church because my oldest daughter wanted to change her skirt, mm -hmm. made a stop. He came in and saw ashen, blue lips, could barely breathe, called my oncologist, rushed me to the hospital. I was diagnosed with a congenital heart defect that I never even knew that I was born with. But the chemotherapy brought it out because it constricted my blood vessels to the point where it was giving me a, over a 90% blockage in my right coronary artery. Heart attack waiting to happen. Mm -hmm. And so when I, so I shared that to say an individual can have weak moments. Mm -hmm. I don't want individuals to necessarily hear my story or see me and say, oh, she's strong. She could get through anything. I'm not like her. I'm different. No, we're not. We share a whole lot the same. Mm -hmm. Cherie had her weak moments, um, but God said it wasn't my time to go. Mm -hmm. And when I came through that, uh, I really, that, that's what started that, pumped up that faith walk. Okay, so I've gotten through this. There obviously is something left undone in my life. So I'm going to have to push past this to figure out what that is. So God, I need you to show me what that is. And the more that I went through my treatment, I kept hearing the word live. And in my mind, I'm thinking, well, yeah, I did. Cause I woke up <laughs> when I tried to die. So I'm living, what's the deal? But then the distinction between living and existing came up. Mm. Prior to that moment, Debbie, I had been existing blessing patients, their families, I mean, doing nonprofit work, serving on boards, I'm doing it all, blessing family members financially, but I was existing. Mm. From that moment on, I knew that I would live, but live had a very different meaning. Wow. Live for me since then now means love myself and others, inspire those around me, voice my dreams and ambitions. Don't keep quiet about it. Let it out and to enjoy life. And so now my faith has built me up to the place where I now insist upon everyday living and helping and grabbing as many people in my circle to live as well and to help individuals who seem stuck and trapped by tragedy or transformations that occurred that they weren't expecting that came from out of left field, I help individuals figure out for them, what does living mean for you? And sometimes it's just concentrating on one letter at a time. Today, I'm just gonna love myself and others. I love this. Okay, so mm -hmm. this is ministry right here. So I just wanna reiterate what Cherie said was when she decided no more existing. If God brought me this far, literally from the brink of death's door and facilitated me to fall asleep long enough for my kids and ex to find me, to get me to the hospital, even though I got all this something, something still ahead of me, I'm going to live. And her acronym is about love, inspire, voice, and enjoy. That's beautiful for a new vision and a path. And I want to go back to Cherie, you brought up your mother um, and becoming a caretaker. And I'm really sensitive to that. My mother has Alzheimer's and I spent the end of last fall into the winter and beginning of this year. I don't know about the word caretaker, but I was it. Tag on it on the West Coast. Only one here. Mm -hmm. And I will say that there was a lot leading up to the three months that my life kind of stopped. I couldn't do my classes. I couldn't teach. I couldn't coach. I was having to do my mom's life. And it was mm -hmm. huge in order to take over someone's life to eventually finally get her into a very nice facility. It is soul killing. It is one of the most difficult yes. things, and I'm still coming out of it. I'm not sure I don't know that it creates PTSD because nobody prepares you for it. There's no like literature here, do this, this, and this, and you'll be fine. Um, nope. And every time I get out there and speak to the few people, people who don't go through it have no clue, like none. They're so none. unaware of what, like, what's the big deal? You know, and if you try to bring Come up- on, just like, do it. Right. 
um, and people have been through it are so compassionate and empathetic. So I just want to talk to you about that because I was doing it as a healthy individual, albeit mm -hmm. it sort of wrecked my business for a while. Um, but to do it going through enormous health challenges, exhausting health challenges, such as you were, how in the world, how in the world were you the caretaker? Were there other people in your family helping out or were you it? Or I don't even, I want to know. Good question. You know, my mom, she died of the condition called sarcoidosis. Um, anybody that knows Bernie Mac, that's the same condition he died of. Her lungs was primarily the organ system that had failed on her. Mm -hmm. And so for the last three years of her life, she really was, uh, it was just palliative care. We had went through everything to figure out whether or not she could be a bilateral lung transplant. We, we tried everything. And I was, she made me the executor of her estate. I am the baby of four children. And there is a seven, nine, and 10 year difference between I and my siblings. So there's a decent enough gap, but I'm also the only doctor. And so my mom made me the executor. And so for the summer of 2007 was when we began her prearrangements for her funeral. I was not diagnosed at that time, but I was the only individual willing to do prearrangements with her because it was too depressing for everyone else. My mom would always say, once we knew that she was not a, a candidate for transplantation and that we were just gonna give her the best care uh, and support as possible until uh, she transitioned, my mom would always say, I am planning to live, but preparing to die. Mm. Love that, it is, that has stuck with me. And so with all intent and purposes, I'm planning to live, but I'm preparing, I'm getting my house in order to die. And so I help with the prearrangements. When I say prearrangements, I mean picking out caskets, casket cascades, the flowers, the, the, the collage, because she wanted a closed casket. I mean, all of these things that brought her so much joy because she's thinking, this will be something that the family doesn't have to do. I'm going to make it easy for them. I'm going home, mind you, with two children, recently separated. I go in my closet close the door so my kids won't hear me and I bawl my eyes out because I'm just like, oh my God, I know this is bringing her joy, but this is taking me closer and closer to saying goodbye. Fast forward to the summer of 2008, she's now, I'm doing things while I'm bringing her to my house and bringing her oxygen concentrators to my house to give her a different place so that she's not stuck at home behind these four walls because now she can't work. So I make a spa experience for her in my home. But I'm exhausted, Debbie. That summer, I'm exhausted. I'm going to work. I'm 12 hours at work. I come home. I make sure she has her spa time. I'm with my two daughters. I'm doing homework and I don't have an appetite, but I'm just going, going, going. I'm losing weight. I don't have an appetite. I'm tired, but I'm taking care of my mom. October 1st, 2008, as she's being transferred to inpatient hospice, what would be for the last time, I happen to be doing my self-breast exam. And that's when I find the mass. And so I have been helping my mom for like over a year now with all of this. And then now that I'm putting her in inpatient hospice to oh get her medications and stuff together, now I find this mass. And in my head, in that moment, I'm literally thinking, Okay, God, I was, I was getting ready and I was all prepared and I've been doing this. I've been doing the prearrangements. I've been doing all of this. Surely I am not about to be diagnosed with cancer. This cannot be happening. But the moment that I felt the mass, I knew that it was cancer. I'm not a pessimistic person, but you know your body. And that's why I tell people, know your normal and I knew that it wasn't. And so now I, I can honestly say that between October 1st and probably January, which is when the time when I had the severe chest pain, I, I think I was in um, some kind of la-la land. I was doing what I needed to do, go to work, take care of the kids, get my testing, do the biopsy. I tried to hide it from my mom until I had the diagnosis, until one day I showed up after my diagnostic 
diagnostic mammogram with my hospital band on. And she said, well, why are you wearing the hospital band? I was like, oh, I just had to go in for some tests. I, mean, I just forgot to take it off. And I remember when I finally had to tell her the diagnosis, my mom said to me, and she's still in inpatient hospice now, I've been asking God, and she would, every holiday, she would say, I don't know why God still has me here, <laughs> but I love you all. But when I gave her the diagnosis, she said to me, now I know why God still had me here. I can't help you, but no baby should have to get that diagnosis without her mommy. <laughs> Broad perspective. One, it forced me to now take advantage of all of these moments. It now forced me to look back on those prearrangements and those times when I would go back in my closet and I would cry. Now see, that's what people missed out on. Those are now my memories. And God knew, God knew I was going to need those because she died while I was still in the midst of so much treatment but I had now formulated and held on to so many precious moments with her in her last days that it fortified me. It gave me this push. Even to this day, I still do things that I know would make my mom proud. I never, if I'm doing something that I feel like, ooh, mama would not like that. I'm 52 years old. But it's something about that connection that we had. No matter where she is, God, no matter what she's able to see or what have you, I want her to be proud of the legacy that now lives through me because of her guidance. So it was extremely difficult. But I was on go-go mode, Debbie. I just pressed through it. When she died, I was there at the bedside. I was not even supposed to be outside. It was my first day of not being able to get chemo because my white blood cell count was low. Doctor told me, don't leave the house. Get your Neupogen, stay in the house, show up tomorrow. We'll try chemo then. But when I came home from chemo, something told me to call the hospice nurse. And when I got on the phone with her, she was like, mom's vitals are my good. Sheree, she's not gonna make it through the night. But you said your goodbyes. You take care of you. I got her. And I told her, Linda, I am so sorry, dear, <laughs> but I will be there. I put on my mask. I grabbed my grandmother. I grabbed my aunt and I grabbed a cousin. And I said, guys, you got to get me out there. Mom is not going to make it. I managed to make it out there at 828. I personally pronounced my mom at 848. I had 20 minutes to get there, say my goodbyes, let her mom say her goodbyes, my dad say his goodbyes. But can you imagine being the doctor to pronounce your own parent as deceased? Mm -hmm. the, 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 the stories and the moments that have occurred throughout my transformation, my renaissance, my reinvention of me are so real and so palpable. Mm -hmm. I think that's what, I know that that's what allows me to penetrate and to, to penetrate the souls of individuals because where I'm coming from is not something that I read in a book, something in a textbook, or something that I heard. I've lived it. It's real. It's real to me today as if it happened yesterday. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> thank you. I just want to say thank you so much for sharing that. Um, it's helpful to me because it would be really hard to beat that story, first of all. <laughs> that is... <laughs> it takes you, Debbie, to say <laughs> so This is not like a caregiver pissing contest. But, I, you know, I mean, it's really inspiring to me. I know, Sheree. <laughs> my girl. Oh my I just want to say, like, you know, I'm going through a very interesting time. And I feel this, like, it's different. I could cry right now. It's so powerful because um, all I wanted when I came, what felt like out the other side with my mom, getting her in a facility finally, and I want my life back and I want to start working again. Fuck it, I'm going to cry. Um, and it's, 
that. It wasn't like easy street, you know, instead my boyfriend of a year and three months just who said he was on my team and all of this suddenly started acting very strange for a while and heartbreaking and we broke up right before lockdown. Not a great time to go through a breakup, I can promise you. And whatever anybody thinks, you would be out having fun, distracting yourself, going to workshops, working. You would not totally up for three months all alone. So there's that piece. I have three best friends. One moved out of country during lockdown. One moved out of state and one lost her mind. That's what I'm calling it because she completely extricated herself. The loss, the amount of loss for me during this has been substantial. And I know it's a deeply profound spiritual time. And trust me, I'm, I'm in it. I'm not running. I'm mm -hmm. feeling, I'm dealing, I'm healing. And it's a roller coaster. I don't know some, one day to another. Is this going to be grief? Is this going to be strength? Is this going to be, I'm just in it. And, um, and I so wanted with my mom, like wrapped in a bow, she's there. Now we can go back, Whoa, you know, and life is going to pick back up and life had different plans for me. So when I hear you yes. at that level, which is like way so much more than what I'm talking about, but still this is my soul journey because I'm facing core wound stuff, you know, that, I thought God knows as a healer and someone who's been involved in so much healing, I was like, oh, you know, this is done. I've faced abandonment. Right. I've faced neglect. I've faced rejection. I faced loneliness. Oh, ha, 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 said God, you know, <laughs> like <laughs> something for you to take a look at and really walk through. So I'm deeply moved by what you said and how you are able to navigate. And I think you might agree with me when I say this, like a year from now, from your situation, five years, 10 years, you can look back and go, damn, like, how did I get through that? That should have killed me. But when you're in it, Absolutely. all you know is the next, the next, take the next breath, the next step, yes? Totally. You are totally right. And, and I had to, when I was in it, I remember individuals telling me, uh, one right after, uh, after my mom died, it was really interesting because when she died at the moment that I was there, and I know that it's happening, I'm a physician. I, I know the types of breathing, the shine stokes. I mean, I, I know that this is happening in my brain. I'm wrapping up. God, not now, not really, but she can't stay like this. I mean, I know she needs to be, but no. So when, but when it happened and now I'm going through planning the home going, you know, celebration and all of that, Debbie, I had anticipated that there was going to be a pouring in of support and that I wasn't going to have to do anything. And that even though I was the executor, you know, people were going to say, you know, I know that mom or, or auntie wanted this, but I got this now girl, cause you sick and I got this and I got, that's not what happened. People still showed up my house and said, Oh, okay. So what, what are we doing? Um, okay. Well, we need to do X, Y, and Z. Okay. We get that going. So you have any food? You know how people when you I would used to watch movies and people would bring the when there was death in the family they would bring food with but they didn't bring me any food and I'm thinking I have two kids that need to eat I'm going through chemo I can't eat anything but at least feed them I had not only did I not have food but people came to my house we work on the program I'm in the midst of chemo and you're asking me if I have food it was just I felt like I was in Light zone. But getting through that as I'm going through that, people are telling me, Sheree, I know you're going through, but you know, your mama's in a better place. And you know, you just got to do what you got to do. I know that they were being trying to be kind. Yes, my mom is in a better place, but I'm here without my mom. So don't dismiss my pain or don't think that just making that statement makes my pain go away. Rather, maybe open up your arms and say, girl, come here, put it right here put it right here, go as long as you need to go, I'm right here. Don't tell me 
when I do cry, oh, keep it together now, keep it together, don't cry, don't cry. How, how the lunacy that I went through at that time um, caused me to actually write my own book. And I, I wrote it so that other people could learn. It wasn't so much to expose the individuals in my life, but I knew that my story was not unique, that there are other people that are experiencing the same thing, but they don't know how to approach it. They don't know if they should be okay with it. But I actually allowed a very close member to, at, at, the, at my mom's deathbed, after she has now died, I'm asking them, give me four minutes, tell me when four minutes has passed so I can pronounce her. And then I begin to lose it. But everything is coming to me. I didn't get chemo. Uh, I, I now I'm just going to lengthen the time that I have to go through chemo. Will I be able to get chemo again? If they decrease the, the chemo dose, will the cancer come back? I mean, I'm running and then now my mom has died. And so all of the emotion comes out. And while I'm crying, they tap me on the back and say, okay, Sheree, keep it together. Keep it together. And I did. I was dumb enough <laughs> to stop crying. And then I kept it together. There's no way that I should have kept it together. So I tell everybody, have your moment. And if somebody trying to take your moment from you, you need to walk away. So Debbie, you are entitled to have this moment going through what you went through with your mom and even putting her in the best place. Your relationship now with your mom is very different. It's very different. And you know, and I know you've done the research, the progression is going to cause that relationship to continue to evolve and change. And you're going to have more realization of it than she will. And as a result, that's painful. So you need individuals in your corner. Just like uh, when you're the person who lost out, he lost out. He walked out on a blessing and um, boom, but boy, bye is what I would say. <laughs> He missed out. Okay. He missed out. He walked out, but at the same time I was going through divorce. And so I went through that whole, uh, ordeal alone, not without the significant other. Now my ex was present cause he was there with the girls. We co-parented, we were friends. So that was helpful. But then there was that certain level of intimacy, you know, that you would share with someone that, that was missing. You know what I'm saying? Wow. And so as you go down this new path, this new grieving path, this change, changes in your life that occur, you really need to cause your thoughts to go back to those times when it may have not have been this bad, but I've been in some pretty jacked up situations before and I've come through it. That's where you need to take your thoughts back to it. You got to take yourself back to the times when you thought you weren't going to come through and you did. The times when people may have said, oh girl, this is not going to be successful. I don't know why you starting a podcast. What's a podcast? What exactly do you do? And then 13 years later, have a syndicated podcast. So you have to take yourself back to those types of things to help build your faith. Because in that situation that you're shaped, your faith gets shaken. It's like, oh, I can't see a light at the end of the tunnel. And when you have people tell you, oh, girl, you only have, you only have 10 more chemo sessions. Girl, you only have 10 more. Do you know what that sounds like to a cancer patient? 10 sounds like 100,000. <laughs> Can you put the word only in front of it? Let me see. How many chemo sessions have you been through? Oh, you said zero, but I only have 10 more. So, you know, you have, you have to shift when people are saying crazy stuff to you. Sometimes you need to let them appreciate just how cray-cray that sounds. But then in the process, when they've left, and you're in your quiet moments, the thoughts they may pop into your head, my mom just died, I'm going through divorce, I gotta feed my kid, am I gonna ever be back normal again? Instead of, those thoughts, they, they, they pop in your mind, that's the way our brains are set, but you can choose where you dwell. And I had to force myself not to dwell on all of those negative thoughts that kept coming into my head I had to instead dwell on those times when God brought me through that. Yep, he brought me through that too. Yep, my mama said this too shall pass. Yep, my mama said she wanted to see Jesus. Guess what my mama got? She got what she wanted. She isn't. So, you know, I had to take myself there to build my faith. Oh my God, where you dwell, where you dwell. Well, we're going to take a quick break. Clearly, there's much more to discuss. We come back. 
<clears throat> we'll talk a little bit about cultural and workplace diversity with Dr. Cherie. And I want to talk to you about this auspicious time. I'm sure you've got your own story and your own message, maybe a lifetime, maybe right now, <clears throat> maybe connected to your work or your being, but stand for your greatness. So many people right now are saying, I've got all this creativity, or maybe I'm bored, or how do I channel, or how do I keep working? I'm here to take a stand for you. I developed a membership platform literally for right now, and people are signing on. It's at debbiedashingercom slash visible visionaries for you to become visible and write your book. In fact, write a page turner book and take your idea from start to publish, voila. And I will get you there with ease. I work with people all the time privately. I work with them in groups. But this is the first time I'm doing an amazing membership platform. Go to debbiedashingercom slash Visible Visionaries. Did you know that there are more people reading right now than ever before? Of course, what else are you gonna do? So reading, audibles, eBooks, Kindles, and more. Be one of those books that people are reading. So in six months from now, you can say, look what I did with that year, with that time. Let me show you how. Debbie-Shinger.com. <clears throat> D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash Visible Visionaries. Get coached and take your book to publish. So we're coming back with Dr. Cherie. And I do want to talk about the transformation that you've had. I find that fascinating. Cultural and workplace diversity. You've been doing it for more than two decades. So what have you seen in culture, Cherie? What have you seen also in workplace environments that caused you to say, I need to become a facilitator for change here? Mm -hmm. Well, I've seen um, in different organizations. So I serve on several different boards. I'm also um, a fellow in a number of different uh, professional organizations. Uh, and then also with working uh, within the largest healthcare system in Illinois. What I would find is there would be, um, I wouldn't say an onslaught, or maybe I would, that there was this uh, HR would hire in a, a number of different individuals. And, and what I would see is that sometimes there were individuals that seemed to all kind of go into one field, like in, in the hospital, you know, so the transport would all be you know, kind of similar in ethnicity and cultural makeup and maybe, you know, physicians would be, you know, be a large number of here and nurses may be uh, slightly different. Uh, and, and what would happen is if you look at break rooms and if you look at how they dealt with patients, when you listen to the, the patient's uh, journey throughout that organization, it was very different based upon who they were dealing with. So transport, bringing one set of culture, how they approached the patient, what they said, how they left the individual. Now you pass off to the nurse and then now she's giving her own, and then you get to the physician who may be more a mix between culture and education and maybe maybe not have the best bedside manner or maybe had a whole bunch of bedside manner, but didn't really explain the whole medical process to the patient. So I just saw that there was a disconnect. And in the role that I had, because I was the program medical director um, with the largest healthcare system in Illinois, I won't say any names, but we can figure it out. I, I figured, you know what, there is something that we need to do system-wide. We have, we can't control the patient population coming in but we can control the individuals within our organization that's going to give patients and the individuals that walk through that door a more seamless approach uh, and almost like a blank slate in the sense that when they see the individual that is helping them, they're not seeing color, ethnicity, background, or what have you. We kind of have a uniform system of how we greet and how we deal with patients. Now, what I went further in doing is, hey, but let's do some team building 
around our different cultures, around our different ethnicities, so that we can better appreciate where you're coming from when life is happening to you before you come into these four walls, because life for someone of Indian descent is going to be different than life for an individual of African American descent, what they eat in the morning, how they deal with their children, the expectations that they have just because culturally we've been taught and brought up differently. And so I think it's it was important that if we're going to create a unified uh, front for our customers and our clients, to best do that, we need to understand where each other is coming from, not passing judgment, not making any assumptions based off of a TV show or something that we saw in the movie, but actually creating team building exercises. So what is that now like? I is that like, um, you know, there's a word thought storm. I don't know how much people understand that, but where you sit with other individuals and you just, I, it's like an idea fest, but everything's a contribution. Nothing is terribly solid, but you have a theme. And then you can really get to know people and usually something is born out of it. Is that the kind of- Correct. Uh, yeah, contributions that you created. That is exactly right. It is. It was actually brainstorming around simple day-to-day -day processes and having individuals give their input. And when you mapped it out, you realize that there were some overlaps, maybe slightly different, but when you delve a little bit deeper and say, well, why, why would you do that? You were, you were typically able to take it back to something that was a learned behavior. And a lot of their learned behavior came from their cultural and eth ethnic background and, and bring and the way that they were brought up. And so I now turn that into a positive. It's not a, it's not a negative. Just realize the wealth of information that we have and what mm -hmm. we can truly bring and pull together with all of these different insights. I now had an insight for individuals that are of Indian descent and I've never stepped foot in India. <laughs> no, but again, listening with, an ear to truly so hear and ask listen. ask you this, because that's huge. I really get that. How do you implement things like that? Because in my estimation, to sit around and have that level of conversation is very lofty and awesome. But to actually take the pieces gleaned, here's somebody from Chinese descent, here's somebody from, I don't know, name, name, name a country, Ethiopian descent, um, et cetera, you know, Malaysian descent and, and Indian descent. And you get these amazing pieces that actually, were they to be used, are going to create something so much more holistic mm -hmm. for people who are coming for healing experience. But how do you take that and actually implement it into the system so it's successful? Well, you start with smaller groups and you start with one piece of a process. And so if you decide, hey, let's map out patient flow for an independent standalone facility. Patient walks in, and so you have someone that, okay, patient walks in, da, da, da. So they have every single touch point. You start with just that first touch point from when they walk in the door and they meet the, greet the receptionist. You start off with, well, one, I'll have my HR person do some kind of funny little team building, hee hee ha ha, break the ice kind of deal. But then I'd say the touch point that we want to work on today is when that individual first walks in that door and greets the receptionist and they're there for a follow-up visit, what, what does that look like to you? And I will have them do role play. And then the other individuals get to sit around and watch that role play. Because when you're watching an individual and observing, and this comes from my medical uh, training in medicine, we're taught to observe first before I ever ask you a question. I'm watching the way you walk in the door, how you sit down, the way you turn your neck, because certain things I can diagnose simply by you walking in the door. Yes, ma'am, absolutely. Really? Sim simply like by you what? walking in the door. <laughs> like Parkinson's. I could tell, I can tell you now if an individual walked in, I could tell you whether or not they had Parkinson's or not simply by the way they walk. I could diagnose Bell's palsy. I can diagnose a, you know, a stroke and I can pretty much kind of tell you whether or not this is more acute versus later simply 
by observing you. Mm -hmm. And so by observing a person that comes in, that walks in, let's say Latina descent, and they come in and, and I tell them, I want you to come in like you could be a real potential patient. And so they may come in, hola, como estas? And you're doing it, donde esta? And they go on, and now the receptionist now has to role play. Well, what does that look like? She's, you know, born in the U.S., Caucasian. So now we are now looking at this interaction now, and now we can learn Hmm. So see, sometimes this is a young woman. She's in her 20s. We're expecting that she's going to come in, speak English. She did not. So now how do we approach that? And really it's taking one piece of the puzzle, viewing it from an observation standpoint, allowing a certain time period for brainstorming. Because like you said, you could, I could brain, we could brainstorm for 12 hours. Nope. We have a set period of brainstorming and we're all got our flip charts out, we're writing them down, we're writing down issues. And then we categorize them and see where is their overlap, see where our circles overlap, and then where are things way out in left field. Sometimes things out in left field turned out to be the things we need to try to bring into the center of the circle because mm -hmm. they were really important. But you don't know that until you can actually see it and visualize it. And then we put together uh, and map out what that process should really look like that's going to give that true global experience, no matter who's walking through the door, to feel comfortable with that one piece. And when we have it, then we move to the next piece. You know, I But think it really is breaking it down. That's so beautiful. I love that you can create change at that level. I mean, anyone who walks into one of those hospitals will be the recipient of what you just did creating something beautiful out of diversity. And I think you'll appreciate this. My brother is also a cancer survivor, stage four squamous cell carcinoma. He had his own journey. Wow. And, um, he also came out the other side completely different. You know, he's a world renowned composer, award winning mm. composer. And um, when he came out the other side, he and his wife made some conscious changes. He still does music and other things, but the medical system was so jacked, he couldn't believe he would go for treatments and sit in a waiting room with televisions blasting horrific news and gunshots and horror. And he's like sitting there going, are you serious? Or I'm waiting for my blood test results. And he was a mess. Right. So he literally created a television for doctors waiting offices and gorgeous pictures come by with affirming statements, his music beneath it. I mean, when I first saw the inaugural TV set, if you will, which is just a regular TV set, but his software goes through it. Right. I was watching it as a sister to support a brother. I ended up like an hour later, I was so in a trance in the most calm place. And so it's doing well, you know, it's getting out there. They created a meditation app called Live Calm with Cancer, and it's free. You know, you can get it on app stores and for caretakers and doctors and patients and all of that. So for anybody interested, you know, you can go to David Dashinger, it's pretty easy. My name, D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R. He and his wife have done, and of course, I'll, I'll send this to you if you like. Thank you. But I tell you, because I think these pieces are very, very important uptakes. Mm -hmm. When you're in the medical system, it really is inside outside. It's who's working on you, but it's the whole experience as well. So I love what you're saying that from the moment you walk into a hospital, even you're talking to receptionist, you are, you're curated, you're cared for. Somebody is there who sees you and can help you through the system in the best way. So I just want to acknowledge you for all of that and for stepping up when you see something wrong. To exactly. Feel it. Right. We have to. We have to. That was what drew me to medicine in the first place. I wanted to be a doctor ever since I was two years old. Mm -hmm. And I think what could, yes, I never thought about being anything else until the night before my MCAT exams, the admissions test. And I thought, Shoot, what if I don't do well? And what if I don't get in? And in my, in that five seconds, I said, oh, I'll be a CEO of some 
some business or something. And then that was the <laughs> that was the only thought I ever had is that I would jump from either being a physician to a CEO. That just tells you where my brain was at. <laughs> Not starting low, I just go straight to CEO. But anyway, I've always wanted to be a doctor. But what I think reinforced it was the way I received and perceived healthcare while I was growing up. Uh, you know, as a poor black family, you know, we went to the free clinics or whatever you can go to get your basic school physicals or when something was wrong, you went to the county hospital and you saw, you know, blood drippings all on the floor and people just take a number and just very, it was just, I just thought to myself, when I become a physician, mm. I'm going to do something different because when people come to your office or people come to the hospital, they're coming because they need help. We really, this is really not healthcare. We're really in the process, uh, in the business of disease care. Only when you're dealing with preventive medicine, which is why I'm board certified in occupational and environmental medicine, that gives me that preventive medicine side. I'm trying to prevent disease, trying to keep you healthy, mind, body, soul, spirit, all of that, keep you healthy. But when individuals come in, they're coming in because they have a need. The last thing they need is for you to be rude or for you not to be able to give them the proper directions on where to go, or for you not to be able to give them a, a, a kind touch on the elbow to help them through, for you not to be able to help them fill out a form if they don't understand, and for you not to leave and give them a smile on their way out the door. And if somebody mentions, oh man, I'm so, I'm so scared, Ooh, oh, I'm just praying that God to help me. Hey, if you're faith-based and, and your patient says to me, I can't tell you the number of times that a patient has said, yeah, I'm praying, I really hope God will heal me. I will stop right there and say, do you want to have a word of prayer now? And it'll throw them away. A doctor that's, you going to pray with me now, doctor? If you, if you would like to join in prayer, let's have a word of prayer. Going a step beyond because people need help. They need hope. And if your physician can't give it to you, somebody in the medical field can't give it to you, oh my God, when you're sick and ill, huh, you would just be left really feeling like, well, what is the point? And I refuse to have anybody come in my presence and ever walk away thinking, well, what's the point? Beautiful. Oh my gosh. We're going to take a quick break and then we'll wrap it up with Dr. Cherie. And if you are... It's such a weird transition, isn't it? <laughs> but I'm taking it anyway. <laughs> Take it, honey. Take it. <laughs> Take it on the street. All right. And I'm going to. Folks, if you don't want to write a whole book at debbie-shinger.com slash visible visionaries, instead you can write a chapter. I'm making this so simple. I am putting together, I have put together a dog anthology. I love the title so much. It's called The Ultimate book for dog lovers, but it's spelled mutt, <laughs> ultimate dog book for dog lovers. Anyway, debbied.net slash anthology. It's a huge package. And if you would like to write a chapter, you will be well guided through it. If you don't want to write a chapter, I will interview you and have it transcribed. I'm taking it to a guaranteed international bestseller. The authors will be interviewed on podcast. You're gonna have a global press release, a book video trailer, rankings, marketing copy. I mean, it's beautiful because I've done this before for authors and we just all fall in love with the process and have such a great time. If it's in your heart, canines, you're a pet lover, you've owned a dog, dogs, you're in the service dog industry, pet industry, grooming industry, training, canine, if you or a friend or loved one you know is right for this, send them to debbid.net slash anthology. There are only six chapters left. That's how many people have come aboard. So if this speaks to you, don't hesitate. Go there. And that website has all the information as well as a free video for you so you can learn everything, even how to write. So go to debbid.net slash anthology and join us Today, you'll be well held through the entire process and even learn while doing the compilation how to write a page turner. So if a book is next for you, you've got it. I'm coming back. If you're joining us after we started, this is Debbie Dashinger on Dare to Dream podcast. I am speaking with Dr. Cherie. She's a best-selling author and a physician. She's a public health 
expert, certified speaking professional, and a breast cancer survivor. You can find out more about her at Dr. S-H-E-R-I-M-D dot com. Cherie, this is Dare to Dream here at the end. What do you next dare to dream? What are your future dreams and goals? My future dreams and goals is one, to continue to grow my new podcast where medicine meets ministry, Dr. Cherie Talks Faith and Facts. Uh, I am, I'm loving this venture. It has always, it's been on my heart now for probably, oh, wow, more than ooh, two decades. Oh my gosh, I'm getting older. You notice I said older, not old, older. Um, I want where to can grow they hear that. your podcast? They can hear my podcast. I am on Apple. I'm on Google Podcasts. I am on um, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Stitcher, uh, just about probably any platform where you'd like to go and listen to your podcast. You can find Where Medicine Meets Ministry, Dr. Cherie Talks Faith and Facts. And it really is a podcast that it, the, the the title says it. Um, it's, it it's a title uh, and it's a podcast where... I'd like to interview individuals, one such as yourself, that have had these moments in their lives that transform the way they view life, where they may have had a tragedy or pain, but they've turned it into their purpose. Mm. To answer questions of people who say, like they used to tell me when I was going through my diagnosis, I have a whole chapter in my book entitled Churchy Chatter, where people used to say to me, Oh, I don't understand why you're still getting all of this chemo. You just need to pray. We're just going to come together and we're going to pray and the Lord's going to heal you and I don't understand. Well, you know what? Faith without works is dead. My faith says I'm going to get up, go get my chemo and God's going to heal me. Thank you. <laughs> so, and so we have these discussions of, of not only just you know, Christianity is not about religion. It's not about, um, you know, whether or not you believe in God. It really is about your spirituality and what divine healing means to you, whether or not it's a higher power or what have you. We're looking for individuals that have a story of transition, a story of transformation that caused them to change and, and, and spin off in their life because of a unique event, addiction or suicidal thoughts or the loss of a relationship, the loss of a parent. Uh, so I really want that to be uh, hugely successful because I believe it really is an effort of love. It is an effort to, again, leave a legacy and have uh, some, some questions that I've had individuals to ask and bring up uh, all my life just about to have them answered by significant individuals with PhDs, MDs, um, uh, bachelors, associates, no degrees at all, sixth grade education. It really does not matter, but your perspective and how you live life and what life means to you and what you plan on doing with it. That's what I want to share with individuals across the world. I want to continue my international professional speaking. I love speaking in case, you know, your audience has been able to tell. Um, pretty difficult to shut me up. Love speaking. And uh, I just want to continue to live and leave a legacy on how to live. I have really become the queen of how to let go and live. And I want to help as many individuals as I possibly can. Help them to learn how to let go and live today and every day. And then I want to stop having hot flashes. <laughs> bum, bum, my drop that's so beautiful woman really you filled my heart today i'm so grateful you came on the show Thank we will you. be in touch i'm actually going you already manifested me as your pr person because i had a download while you were just speaking and i'm going to connect you with a radio show that is christian based and they're going to love you and they're going to interview you so and so it begins and so thank you so much for coming on and sharing your brilliance professionally and being wise on Dare to Dream. It is such an honor to be in your presence. And it was an honor to be a guest on your show and to be in yours. Thank you, Debbie, so much. Much love Mwah! to you. Mwah! To you as well. And I end today's show with this reminder. If you want to achieve greatness, stop asking for permission. As Nike said, just do it. This is Dare to Dream. You can subscribe to this podcast. It is your weekly number one transformation conversation. 
And next up on the show, I'm happy to say James Redfield from the Celestine Prophecies, who's been here before, asked me if he could come back and do a series on the program. So get ready, y'all, because James has been traveling the world talking about what's going on and what's to come. And he wants to come to Dare to Dream to connect with you and do a series of four shows to talk about that very thing. He'll be disseminating a lot of wisdom and guidance at a time when a lot of people really need it. If you're ready to write your book and want live expert guidance, these are COVID prices, so I uh, highly recommend you go now. It will never be like this again, but it is today for you because I'm here to serve you. I really am here to serve you so you can get your story and message out. DebbieDashinger.com slash Visible Visionaries. And if you'd like to write a chapter in the dog anthology book, only six chapters left, go today. Debbie, D D E B B I D dot net slash anthology. Thanks for joining us today. And remember that the secret of success, as always, is having the courage to begin in the first place. <laughs>